Part 7. Overall Study Learning and Non-Learning Question. Why is it that so many people read so much and yet are not changed by it? Can people not absorb Sufi information through the written word? Answer. To learn something, you may have often to be exposed to it many times, perhaps from different perspectives, and you also have to give it the kind of attention which will enable you to learn. In our experience, people fail to learn from Sufi materials for the same reason that they do not learn other things. They read selectively. The things that touch them emotionally, or which they like or are thrilled by, they will remember or seek in greater quantity and depth. Since these are often the last materials which they will probably need, and since such an unbalanced attitude towards anything makes the person in need of balance in his approach, we have the situation to which you refer. We may at once admit that cultures which seek to highlight crudities, things which immediately appeal, and to project them in attractive forms and endorse and sustain them, are unlikely to produce, on the whole, people with appetites for other than more of the same thing. But this behaviour will merely perpetuate the same kind of personality and attitude which created it in the first place. If you have a chocolate cake decorated with 16 cherries, and you gobble up the cherries because you like them, and then want to know why you have not eaten the cake, what does that make you? And if I tell you, would you like me? This is the barrier to surmount. It is crossed by observing it in action, deciding to surmount it, and taking action to study comprehensively, and not to pretend to be a student and then wonder why one has not learnt. See the mine inside the mountain. Reading does not change people unless they are ready to change. Rumi said, You have seen the mountain, you have not seen the mine inside the mountain. Just because a book is available, even one of the very greatest books, does not mean that one can, or perhaps should, try to learn correctly from it at any given moment. The Sufi Sadruddin said in his testament, Hereafter let not every man seek to learn from the writings of the Sheikh Ibn Arabi or from mine, for that gate is barred to the majority of mankind. This is because teachers may not need what is in books, but can use them for students, while students may not know, but might well not profit from studying them as arbitrarily as they ordinarily do. Even the self-styled specialists, some of them scholars, do not translate the various levels and implications of Sufi materials correctly. In fact, there are indications that many of these people do not see the extra dimensions and alternative readings in the classical literature at all. Some even admit that they have not been able to do this. Somewhat characteristically, they do not seem to stop translating or to enrich their perceptions of the material. The Sufi usage of Hafiz's works is not at all the same as the ordinary translators or readers. I have noted elsewhere that although it has been translated many times and quoted many thousands of times, there is hardly a correct rendition of the very first couplet of Rumi's major classical Sufi work, the Masnavi. We could give hundreds of examples. In fact, let us just open the Gulistan, or Rose Garden, of Saadi and look at a passage and see what we find. Here is a passage. It runs in Persian, Kazani ki yazdan parasti konand, bi awazi dulab masti konand. One English translation gives the meaning, literally enough, as those who are God worshippers become drunken even at the sound of a water wheel. Now the word dulab, water wheel, also means figuratively deceit in Persian. Sadi is saying, therefore, one, that people who worship the divine, Yazdan, go into a state of intoxication even at the sound of a water wheel. This can mean, in this context, either that they can be so conditioned, in the case, of course, of superficialists, 
that anything will throw them into what they regard as a religious state, or else that anything might remind rightly attuned mystics of divinity. And two, either type of person just referred to can be diverted into his or her state, imagined or real, by deceit. So instead of having the unexceptionable but fragmentary translation, anything will throw the religious into an ecstasy, we find a whole range of meanings open up as we look at the words and their alternative significations, including 1. Fixation upon the divine can lead to becoming intoxicated by it, by the sound made by an inanimate object not intended to elicit such a reaction. 2. People who are fixated upon the divine may revert to the intoxication, which may or may not be a veridical mystical experience, by a rhythmic sound. 3. Genuine mystical experiences can be invoked in the devout by rhythmic methods. 4. Experiences thought to be mystical can be elicited in people who have, genuinely or otherwise, engaged in divine worship by deceit. This kind of multiple meaning abounds in Persian poetry. The Sufi has to be able to keep all the alternative possibilities of meaning in mind so as to be able to look at the whole range of possible significances of human experience which ordinary people compress into a far smaller range of understanding. Some Characteristics of Sufi Literature Question. We find, in your book, The Sufis, some illuminating material on Sufi literature. Could you say something more on this subject to help in its study? Answer. Nothing betrays the superficial or the uninformed student when it comes to study and presentation of formerly current texts, like the use made by such people of literature. To be entirely specific, we must point out that those who are primarily literateurs and academic workers have a manner of study and an appreciation of literature which corresponds only with the outer husk of Sufi literature. People are reluctant to admit this possibility, partly because so much of Sufi literature is a part of the classical literary heritage. They think that it must be susceptible only to study for its derivations, variety, elegance, vocabulary, and so on. To say that all this superb material contains something which its self-styled greatest supporters do not perceive is asking for their outraged condemnation. But as this happens to be true, we are obliged to say it. Whether they like it or not, Sufi literature was not written for certain pedants, for Orientalists, or even, often, for the generation of today. There is the husk for all to see. The kernel may be garnered by those who, first, know which is the husk, and also how to reach the kernel. Viewed from this instrumental usage of literature, the activities of memorizing passages, selecting parts which appeal to one, comparing editions and manuscripts, seeking emotional or intellectual stimulus, all this is a different field from the inner functional one represented in this literature. Let it not be denied that such masters as Rumi have boldly stated this fact. Nobody takes any notice, they go on studying Rumi. The result is that they imbibe the teaching material together with the antidote, corrective or protective material in which it is enshrouded. The only effect is cultural, in the anthropologist's sense of the word. From the Sufic point of view, such people are of course completely entitled to their level of appreciation. The seriousness of the situation becomes evident when they teach others, people who are capable of greater understanding, to treat the materials in the same relatively shallow manner as they do themselves. It is at this point that we have something to say and much to do. Such trained individuals, we find, have their scope of being attenuated, their perceptions in the Sufic sense dwarfed. They sometimes become conditioned to certain stimuli, they develop what can be alarming tendencies of a doctrinaire or academic nature. 
Here are a few characteristics of Sufi literature. 1. Some books, some passages, are intended to be read in a certain order. 2. Some books and passages have to be read under specific environmental conditions. 3. Some have to be read aloud, some silently, some alone, some in company. 4. Some are only vehicles for illustrations or other content generally regarded as extraneous or secondary to the text. 5. Some are of limited use or ephemeral function, being addressed to communities in certain places, at certain stages of development, or for a limited time. 6. Some forms have concealed meanings which yield coherent but misleading meanings, safety devices to ward off tamperers. 7. Some are interlarded with material deliberately designed to confuse or sidetrack those who are not properly instructed, for their own protection. 8. Some books contain a completely different potential and they are communicators through another means than the writing contained in them. They are not designed primarily to be read at all. 9. Sufi literature is a part of a carefully worked out plan. Its abuse leads to nothing of permanent value. Sufi teachings, and sometimes keys to it, are sometimes embedded in quite other material, not recognisable as Sufi at all to the uninitiated. Many of these teachings are really meditation themes. They have a deep function almost unknown to pedestrian conventionalists, enthusiasts, imitators or the occultist. Many people familiarise themselves with the classics or any Sufi literature which they can obtain, thinking that they will benefit by doing this. Many again think that they have really benefited. But since the frequency or pattern upon which the studies are planned cannot be penetrated by such people, they do not gain the nutritional and development content of the materials. Even the sheer familiarisation with Sufi materials, for the purposes of future development, must at some point take place in accordance with the school pattern, itself based upon the great design which unlocks the treasures of this extraordinary storehouse. No form of selectivity, no A to Z treatment of study, no mere immersing of oneself in Sufi thought, no participation in Sufi exercises or rituals can, if carried out arbitrarily, and by this we mean without the direction of those who know the pattern, yield the deep Sufic content. People may think that they have gained something, but this is characteristic of the adherents of each and every school, system, religion and so on. What they have gained is much more superficial than they can imagine. These are among the reasons for a special and specialised school to preside over exposure to the Sufi materials. Sufi materials, of necessity, are designed to be perceptible in real meaning to those who are at a stage or in a condition to profit from them. If people are not, they accept shallow, emotional or misguided meanings from Sufic materials. This tendency is paralleled in the behaviour of animals and people at different stages of understanding and states of mind. You can find such examples, showing the failure to use one's mind correctly, every day in equivalent situations in ordinary life. Many Sufi jokes reproduce such situations, but the newspapers are also full of them. Consider the following. The Protected Monument Councillors at Ride, Isle of Wight, burst into laughter last night on hearing from a government department in Whitehall that Seaview Pier was officially listed as a building of historic or architectural interest. The pier was demolished in 1952. Lack of accurate information and the underlying failure to seek it, coupled with the assumption that things were in the condition imagined by whoever drafted that scheduling order, provided the protection of the non-existent peer. 
The same kind of thinking is involved when many people deal with ideas, literature and personalities, rather than buildings. The same kind of mental equipment approaches a different proposition in the same kind of way. You do not even have to be a human being to assume things about something, resulting in harm and uselessness to yourself. Look at this. The Monkey and the Head A man had to be given hospital treatment for a sprained neck in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, when a monkey trained to pluck coconuts from high trees jumped onto his shoulders and began twisting his head. That monkey, no doubt, if trained, would have scheduled a non-existing building as of interest. Communication has to take into account the person to whom something is to be communicated. Consider this and compare it with someone buying a book and reading it according to his own conceptions of what it is trying to convey. Dog and Dinner A Swiss couple told the newspaper Blick that they had taken their pet poodle into a Hong Kong restaurant and signalled to the waiter that they wanted it fed, making eating signs. The poodle was taken away. When the waiter came back with a dish under a silver lid, they found their dog roasted inside, garnished with pepper sauce and bamboo shoots. The couple were reported to be traumatised and to be suffering from emotional shock. Many Sufi teachers, such as Rumi, reflecting in his Fihi Ma Fihi and the Masnavi on how people behave with spiritual materials, have almost an equal air of traumatization. <laughs>